Religiously, we can say, no, Jannah is success. Dunya is not success. We know that. <laughs> I'm not talking about what you say. I'm talking about what goes on in your head. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والعصر إن الإنسان لفي خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر اللهم اجعلنا من الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه ومن استنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين اللهم اجعلنا منهم ومن الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر واللهم ثبتنا عند الموت بلا إله إلا الله آمين يا رب العالمين ثم أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته This is our third get-together for the study of Surah Al-Asr. Hopefully, inshallah ta'ala, our final get-together. It'll be my best attempt to complete the study of the surah today. Uh, but we'll go as, I won't try to rush anything. We'll see how far we get, inshallah ta'ala. Those of you that have been following along, we were up to in al insan. That's what we covered last time we left off there. We discussed the, the usage of the word inna in the ayah and the usage of the word al-insan. And we left it there. Now we're dealing with the part lafi khusr. Lafi khusr. So, roughly translated, no doubt every single human being is truly immersed in loss. The first thing to note here is the, the tools in Arabic language that are being used to emphasize this statement. If you have in English, you have the human being is in loss. That's a statement. But in Arabic, you don't just have a statement. You have a statement and it can be empowered by certain tools. It can be made stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger. Similarly, also in Arabic rhetoric, a statement can be made weaker and weaker and weaker. It can be strengthened, it can also be weakened. This statement, grammatically speaking, is the strongest it could possibly be. First of all, there are two kinds of sentences in Arabic, jumla fi'liya and ismiya. This is ismiya. And you know, there's the noun-based sentence and a verb-based sentence. And in, in rhetorically speaking, the noun-based sentence is stronger than the verb-based sentence. Normally, the Arabs use the verb base when they speak. And in unusual occasions, they will use the noun base. It's stronger. This is a noun base. It's jumla ismiya. It's got a muqtada and a khabar. This is the first thing that makes it stronger. The second is, instead of saying al-insanu fi khusr, it's in al-insan. This is harf at tawqid. This is a harf. This is a preposition used only for the purpose of strengthening what you're about to say. So there's a second reason that it's stronger. The third reason that it's stronger is the word al-insan has al on it, which is lil-jins, which we'll read the commentary of the mufassirun, and we'll see that it implies every single human being. Instead of saying a person or people, it's every single human being adding another degree of emphasis. Then on top of that you have lafi. It's not just fi khusr, it is lafi khusr. This lam, typically you have the word we, the other word fi rather. لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ fi أَحْسَنِ تَقْوِيمِ There's just fi. But this is lafi. Lam here is very difficult to translate, but it basically has the same function rhetorically as inna. Certainly, certainly. Lam, according to some uh, uh, linguists in Arabic, it is also argued it's used to swear on top of an oath. So, for example, laqad khalaqna. Lam is already an oath in and of itself, or used in response to an oath. So it's a it's a means by which something is empowered. Another tool of empowerment. Then you have it's not inna al-insana la khasir. The human being is a loser. Or even the khabar could have been a verb. Inna al-insana laqad khasara. Or khasira rather. Right? The human being has lost. Lafi khusr. He is in loss. The image we used to be talked about it last time, the one who's being drowned, he's immersed in it. You know, someone being a loser is one thing. And by the way, ism fa'il in Arabic it implies something that's happening right now. But by using the preposition, it becomes a constant state. He is immersed in it, he's been in it, he's gonna stay in it kind of thing. It's a scenario that's being depicted. So the word fi here adds to that. Then there's a, like uh, Al-Mazhari comments, fi khusrin, the tanween, to, you know, yufidu al-azma. The tanween at the end, khusr isn't just loss, it's incredible loss. Just because there's tanween at the end, khusrin, because of that. 
So one after another, after another, after another mechanism by which this statement has been emphasized. And above and beyond all of that, Allah began with wal asr by taking an oath. And the oath, among other things, is also a manifestation of anger. We talked about the other purposes of the oath last time, but the, another manifestation of the oath is anger. For example, even nowadays you're talking to each other, I, I, I swear, you better stop. I swear I'm going to get you, you know. When you use the I swear, it's a manifestation of anger. So the fact that Allah Azza wa Jal swears before He mentions the loss of the human being in and of itself is a means by which this statement is emphasized. So there are tools by which this statement is emphasized over and over and over and over again. The human being is in loss or verily the human being or man is at loss, mankind is in doom, etc, etc. Don't even begin to cover the rage and the, the terror that is embedded in the language of this ayah. That Allah Azza wa depicts in the words, إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ لَفِي خُسْرِ Let's talk a little bit about the word khusr. We in the, in the original session I told you there's a difference between the word khusr that's used here. Then there's the word khusran that occurs in the Qur'an also. And then there's the word khasar, khasara. And the difference between them, just as a quick recap, khusran is the worst kind of loss. So for example, Allah says, خَسِرَ الدُّنْيَا وَالْآخِرَةَ ذَلِكَ هُوَ الْخُسْرَانِ he lost the dunya and the akhirah, that is the ultimate loss. That's the worst kind of loss. That's not for everyone, but that's for the worst kind of person. Then khusran is used. Khasar is used when you are already in trouble and you add to your trouble. So for example, وَاتَّبَعُوا مَنْ لَمْ يَزِدْهُ مَالُهُ وَوَلَدُهُ إِلَّا خَسَارَ It's used with ziyada usually. It didn't increase them in anything but loss. Meaning they were already in trouble, it added to their trouble. It's used in that sense. But khusr is the, 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 the base form. Meaning generally all human beings are in a state of tremendous loss. So khasira, the way it's used in Arabic is also used in the meaning of suffering. In addition to loss, loss is the common translation. Khasira fi bay'ihi also means he suffered loss in his business. It also means to lose your capital altogether. We, we made reference to this before also. You put your money in a business. Not only does it not make money, but you lose your, all your investment money also. This is called khusr. If you lost, you know, just the profits, you broke even, this is not called khusr. If you lost the money you, you put in of your own, all of it is gone too. The essential capital, what's called in Arabic, ra'sul mal. If that is gone, then that's called khusr. It's also, by the way, used when you are conned. Like if you say khasira tijaratuhu, it's uh, one of the meanings of that is his business went under, but it also means his business was destroyed by means of some kind of trickery. Somebody conned him, somebody deceived him, and that made his business go down. So there's this, there's this allusion to uh, deception also in the word khusr. Human beings are deceiving themselves. They're in a kind of deception, and that's leading them to a loss. The antonym, the opposite of khasirat tijaratuhu is rabihat tijaratuhu. His, his business became profitable. That he not only put in his money in, he got more out of it too. So Allah Azza wa uses this word. This is a little bit about the word khusran. Let's talk a little bit about the word al-insan in the ayah. Just as the, the, we, we talked about it linguistically before, but just what the ulama have said. Al-insan lil-jins. Anna nasa fi khusran min tijaratihim. First, al-insan lil-jins. That this word insan is referring to all human beings. So when Allah says the human being is no doubt in deep trouble, in deep loss, there is no exception. Because the jins in Arabic means the entire category. There, no one should think when they read the ayah, not me, somebody else. I can think of my neighbor, I can think of these other kuffar that are in trouble. That's not the idea when you use the word jins. It is a universal statement. Then the second, we read this in Zamakhshari also, أَنَّ النَّاسَ فِي خُسْرَانٍ مِنْ تِجَارَتِهِمْ إِلَّا الصَّالِحِينَ وَحْدَهُمْ that people are in tremendous loss because of the trades they make. In other words, they put their money and their effort and their time into things that they think will bring them profit, but they bring them nothing but loss. إِلَّا الصَّالِحِينَ Except for the righteous, وَحْدَهُمْ Them alone. May Allah make us from them. لِأَنَّهُمُ اشْتَرَاوُ الْآخِرَ بِالدُّنْيَا Because those are the people, who, which trade did they do? They purchased the akhirah in exchange for giving up the pleasures of dunya. That's the, that's the transaction that the salihin made. فَرَبِحُوا وَسَعِدُوا That then they were profitable and they were happy. وَمَنْ عَدَاهُمْ تَجَرُّوا خِلَافَ تِجَارَتِهِمْ And then whoever was an enemy against them, who, who stood against this transaction of theirs, فَوَقَعُوا فِي الْخَسَارَ وَالشَّقَاوَةِ Then they remained in loss and in, uh, in despair. Then we read something from Ash-Shawkani, وَالْمَعْنَى أَنَّ كُلَّ إِنسَانٍ فِي الْمَتَاجِرِ وَالْمَسَاعِ Beautiful words. He says that this means that every human being is in an act of selling and trading, 
and making efforts constantly. Meaning they're competing in making more sales than the other and they're competing in getting ahead from the other. This is what they're lost in. And if you remember, this is very similar to what we talked about in At-Takathur. His tafsir of this word is very similar to what we already read in At-Takathur. وَصَرَفَ الْأَعْمَارُ فِي أَعْمَالِ الدُّنْيَا And he, he exhausts his ages. By a'mar, he's referring to his age, meaning youth is one age, maturity is one age, you know, middle age is one age, then old age and senility. He exhausts all of his, ta- his life opportunities in the works of dunya, lafi nuqs, and all of them that have been exhausted. وَصَرْفُ أَعْمَارٍ فِي أَعْمَالِ الدُّنْيَا لَفِي نُقْسِ They are all in loss. وَضَلَالِ And in waste. عَنِ الْحَقِّ حَتَّى يَمُوتِ And he's misled from the truth until he dies, and then he wakes up. وَقِيلَ الْمُرَادْ بِالْإِنسَانَ الْكَافِرِ We talked about this before, but it's coming up directly from the Mufassiru now. It has also been said that the insan in this surah refers to the kafir. That the meaning of al-insan, إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ لَفِي خُسْرِ Some have understood this as, إِنَّ الْكَافِرَ لَفِي خُسْرِ وَقِيلَ جَمَعَةٌ مِنَ الْكُفَارِ It's also been said, it's a group from the kuffar. وَهُمُ الْوَلِيدِ بِنْ مُغِيرَ وَالْعَاصِ بِنْ وَائِلْ وَالْأَسْوَدِ بِنْ عَبْدِ الْمُطَلِبِ بِنْ أَسَدْ وَالْأَوَّلْ أُولَى Others say that no, this is a group from the kuffar, specifically in the life of the Prophet, like Walid ibn Mughira, Aas ibn Wail, Aswad ibn Abdul Muttalib. These are the kinds of individuals, لَعَنَهُمُ الله, that are being referred to in this surah. But even as Shawkani rahimahullah says, but the first meaning is preferred among these who say they are kuffar. The ones who generally refer to the kuffar is the preferred meaning. But then even that has a criticism which we'll get to. وَقَالَ الْأَخْفَشْ فِي خُسْرِ فِي هَلَكَ Al-Akhfash rahimahullah says, when Allah says فِي خُسْرِ, he is in loss, what he means by that is, he is in destruction. Halaka. Halak actually literally means violent death. You know, there's maut, that's death. But halak or halak is violent death, like a death in a car accident or you know a, a vicious kind of death. So he's putting himself, setting himself up from this for this vicious end. وقال الفراء عقوبة and he, Farah says that this is a, a, a terrible ending. Ruquba means an, a consequence, an ending that is uh, scary for others to watch. In other words, one's end, that when other people see this, I don't want to end up like that. And you use his Ruquba as an example among yourselves. You, say, you know, you remember what happened to him? You don't want to go down that road, that kind of thing. So this is Ruquba. Then Ibn Zayd rahimahullah, he says, Lafi Sharr. Lafi Khusr here implies Lafi Sharr, that he is in, immersed in evil. Because the ultimate loss of the human being is his engrossment in evil deeds. We read something from Ash-Shaqiti rahimahullah. لفظ الإنسان وإن كان منفردا فإن ألفه جعلت جعلته للجنس. The word al-insan, even though it's singular, it has been used for all humanity, generally speaking. Then we come to a very, very important comment that is made by Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah. And it's so powerful that it's even quoted by Mufti Muhammad Shafi'ah in his Urdu tafsir, uh, uh, Ma'arif al-Qur'an. The translation of which is also available in English. It's not the best English, so if you can read Urdu, read the Urdu trans- t- tafsir, Ma'arif al-Qur'an. Uh, but those of you who don't have access to that language, at least some, something of the English is available. What is this comment that is so beautiful that I'm referring to by Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah? He says that humanity is kept from accepting reality, accepting the truth of this deen by two obstacles. There are two obstacles that keep human beings from saving themselves. Now what is the path to save yourself? There are two things. Those are, in the Qur'an we find, الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا wa. What's after wa? عَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَ This is what we find all over the Qur'an, right? They believe and they act. They believe and they act. Even though we haven't talked in detail about what iman is Allah referring to, what righteous deed is Allah referring to. We're just using them as terms, as tags and phrases right now. But generally, this is the path to salvation. This is the path to save yourself and be successful in the akhirah. The first step, iman. The second step, action. Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah argues there are two obstacles before the people that keep them from iman and action. What are those two obstacles? He calls them shubuhat and shahawat. Shubuhat and shahawat. What does that mean? Shubuhat means doubts. Shahawat means temptations, desires. So he says the two things that keep people from accepting the truth are doubts and temptations. What, what does he mean by that? You see, when you ask someone to accept this deen, you're asking them to give up a lot of things. You're asking them really to give up a lot of things. You know, I had a friend in college, a uh, you know, big guy, really like, you know, loved football. And you used to talk about Islam all the time. And I'd say, man, why don't you just accept Islam? I can't give up that pork, man. I just can't give it up. That's some good stuff. What's his obstacle? He's not in doubt. His, do- his obstacle is not doubt. He's convinced this is good. His, do- his obstacle is his temptation. 
Another one says, I can't give up the life of partying, I can't, can, can't give up the women, I can't give up the clubs, I can't give up the drugs, I can't give up this or that or the other. These are desires. On the one hand, there's a person who says, this is right, but I cannot live by this because I'm too po the gravitational pull of temptation is just too strong for me. This is one problem. Here's another problem. Here's a person who doesn't accept you know, what this is because he's not sure if this is the truth. You know, they'll say, how do you know yours is the only right religion? There are so many religions out there. What about them? What about all those people? They're gonna just go to hell? That's what you believe? I can't accept that. That's just, I'm not sure if, how can there be just one right way? No, if there was just one right way, why wouldn't everybody just follow it? These kinds of questions come in this person's mind. And they fall into what? Doubt. This is the root of doubt. Either one of these things will keep you from the deen. Either one of these things. And by the way, most people, the problem is in doubt. Most people, the problem is temptations. And then when they fall into their temptations, shaitan comes in and adds a new virus which is doubt. So when you call them to the deen, they say, I am in doubt, but the real problem wasn't doubt. What was it? The temptations. So they, they, in other words, there's a psychological problem and there's an intellectual problem. You could also call it a spiritual problem, a problem of the heart, which is temptation. There's an intellectual problem, a problem of the mind, which is doubt. Most people that give the excuse of the intellectual doubt, actually that's not true. They're, that's a cover, that's a facade. The real problem is, their hearts have desires. And they don't want to give up their desires, and to cover that up, they make all kinds of intellectual excuses. And when you get rid of all of them, the truth comes out that it was really their desire. I don't want to change. You know, I don't want to change. This is, this is his, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, sad state that he doesn't want to come out of. Now, why mention this in the midst of this surah? You see, at the end, Allah says, الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ But He mentioned two more things, didn't He? وَتَوَاصَوْا بِالْحَقِّ وَتَوَاصَوْا بِالصَّبْرِ Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah argues, وَتَوَاصَوْا بِالْحَقِّ Truth is the removal of what? Doubt. Truth is the weapon against doubt. So, وَتَوَاصِي بِالْحَقِّ gets rid of one obstacle. And what was the other obstacle? Shahawat, temptations, desires. To fight against those desires, knowing the truth is not enough. What must you have? The strength to not fall into them. The strength to hold back, to control yourself. Where does that come from? Watawasawbi? Asab. You see how beautifully those two obstacles that keep people from iman and amal saliha, they are mentioned in watawasaw bil haq and watawasaw bil sabr. This is the, the comment that I felt was very, very important for us to understand. Now we're going to look at some other uh, commentary. I'm going to go just through my notes so I don't miss anything inshaAllah ta'ala. The first comment just about this ayah. You see, in these two ayat, Allah Azza wa has depicted a very powerful reality. And one element of that is that human beings are so preoccupied with their personal problems. You know, Allah says human beings are in loss, right? But it's, you know, we're, talking, we're thinking about the hellfire and the day of judgment and all of that. But even the way Allah created the human being in this earth, before He has also said, we've already studied, لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي كَبَدْ We created the human being, no doubt, in toil, in labor. Even the kafir has to work hard. You've got to you know, work 40 hours, 50 hours to get a paycheck and barely survive, barely make an income. That's their state too. It's not easy for anyone. So even, you know, and there are people in the world who are Muslim or non-Muslim that barely get food to eat or they see their children starving and they see all kinds of oppression. So it's not like for the kuffar, all the kuffar, this world is Jannah also. They're also in loss as even in worldly terms. They're in, they're, you know, they suffer a lot of problems. But you know what happens? Human beings, when they completely immerse themselves in their own problems, that's all they think about is themselves. Then they fail to see that they are part of a larger picture. And they fail to see that their problems are nothing compared to the problems that are lying ahead. You think this is a problem? There's way bigger lying ahead. So they think they are in loss now, but if you put it in perspective, it's nothing compared to the loss that is coming. This is the first thing that we want to make note of. Then you know what happens when you don't have iman, when you don't have this key that we're going to talk about in the next ayah, your problems get blown out of proportion. You think I've got some really big problems. You know, I, I get reminded, even I, you know, human beings are weak, we have these kinds of things. You know, and when I used to live in Maryland, our basement, it flooded, right? And I was like, oh my God, oh, the carpet's wet, it's soggy, this, that, the other. Alhamdulillah, we don't have basements in Texas, so it's cool. But you know, so basement, and I, and I called this brother to help out, you know, get rid of the water and stuff. And I'm all stressed out, you know, the kids are upstairs and, you know, electronics and this and that. 
And the brother comes and the brother is a good brother, alhamdulillah, he's from, uh, happens to be from Somalia. He's a really good like handyman and he helps out with the Islamic school in the masjid there. And the brother's helping out and he says, you look worried, akhi. And I was like, yeah, you know, it's all this problem. He goes, don't worry about water, akhi. You can't fight water, it killed Fir'aun. <laughs> you know, and we just started talking and we're talking and he tells me his life story. SubhanAllah, SubhanAllah. He was like five years old when his village was attacked by enemy tribes. And he survived on the back of a donkey hiding in hay. And he's traveled as a kid. His parents were executed. He was the only child left in the family. From five years old, he's been living on his own, just traveling like half of Africa. He went to Ethiopia. He ended up in like the Khalij. He started working for a sheikh, learned some little bit of trade, became an engineer. He's got the craziest story. You know, and when you hear his story, you say, man, I got no problems. <laughs> we get lo- you get immersed in your problems and you blow them out of proportion. And this is another loss of the human being. He is at a loss to see that what, he, what problems he has are nothing compared to what's out there. He fails to see the gratitude that Allah Azza wa he owes Allah Azza wa And when this happens, when human beings are so preoccupied with their own life, their own problems, they fail to see the lessons in three things. The three things I want to highlight to you. The first is the lessons in the creation of Allah. They no longer look at the creation of Allah as signs that remind you what your real purpose in life is. What are the real problems that you should avoid? Financial problems are nothing. Health problems are nothing. The problem of Iman is something big. In comparison, this is nothing compared to that problem. You know? You have social problems is nothing. You know, job problem is nothing. Compared to the problem that I'm immersed in evil deeds and I need to start doing good deeds to save myself, that's a much bigger problem. And the ayat of Allah, the creations of Allah, when you reflect on them, naturally what happens is you remember your Creator, you remember what you owe Him and where you're headed. They fail to see the creations around them as signs. Another thing they fail to see is the lessons of history, which is actually what this surah is highlighting. When, when Allah says, Wal Asr, remember the word Asr, time as it passes away? If you just reflect on history and how many people have come and failed and have gone, they had a little bit of time to become a success and they didn't make use of that time and they failed and they're gone and their chance is over. Then a new generation came with a new chance and they lost their chance and their time was over. And now it's my turn, I have a chance. I better not make the mistake that these people made, which is why Allah tells me of the nations of the past who lost the opportunity. You know, Allah is alluding to all of those historic accounts in the Qur'an just in the word wal asr. Because all of them, their ultimate loss was not availing the time that they had before it gets too late. You know, مِن قَبْلِ أَنْ يَأْتِيَ you know, عَذَابٌ أليم. Before a punishment comes, make veil of that, you know, uh, avail that time. And finally, of course, the signs of revelation. When you're too preoccupied with your own life, you fail to look at the Qur'an, you fail to look at revelation, you fail to look at the legacy of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for guidance of how should I live my life, what should I aspire towards. Because if your only concern is your career, you're really not gonna get career advice in programming from the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Right, you're not gonna get that from the Qur'an. But if you're looking for where should I spend my money, how should I raise my kids? How should I be to my neighbor? What, do I, what more do I owe my parents? When you start thinking, you know, why am I, what good can I do? Then you turn to the book. Then you turn to the Messenger So this preoccupation with the self, in and of itself, is a loss of the human being. Then, uh, as far as, uh, one of the beautiful things I want to comment on also is a, a statement from Shah Waliullah Dahlwi rahimahullah. Talking about asr, the word asr in this ayah, and connecting it with the loss of the human being, uh, Shah Waliullah Dahlwi rahimahullah has a term he uses for certain passages of the Qur'an. He calls them At-Tadhkir bi ayyamillah Reminder by the days of Allah. Reminder by the days of Allah. What are the days of Allah? It is the day He created the human being, the day on which He sent revelation to His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa the day of Badr, the day on which the, the, the flood came to the, the, the disbelievers against Nuh alayhi salam, the day when the water was parted, the day when Fir'aun was destroyed, etc. The day when Musa alayhi salam spoke to Allah azza wa These are amazing days in human history. And Allah uses, Allah refers to these awesome days all over the book, doesn't He? Of course, in the future, there are also amazing days coming. The day of judgment, the day on which the believers will get to see their Lord, etc., etc. These are, the, these are you know, incredible occasions of time. And by using wal asr, and to save ourselves that, that warning, it is if we only remember those days of Allah, they would be enough for us to not fall into loss, to keep things in perspective. That's the commentary of Shawali Allah Dahlbi Rahimahullah. 
And finally, uh, something Hamiduddin Farahi said, which also I found very, very beautiful. He said, one of the lessons of this surah is a lot of people, they go, you know, when, they, when, they, when you get a vacation and you go like uh, to, to a historical site, right? People want to go visit the Great Wall of China or they want to see the ancient monuments in Rome, right? Or you go to Algeria by the water, the Roman Empire had built these like amazing forts and, and uh, you know, a docks for the ships and stuff like that. You go see these historical sites and people take pictures next to them with smiles on their face. But what are those monuments a sign of? They're a sign of destroyed nations. They're literally, if, you know, a grave is a, a record of a person who died. But those monuments are a record of a nation that died. Think about that. Those are graves of an entire nation. So when you go to them, you should remember how these people didn't avail their time and their time was gone. No matter how high and big and powerful they thought, time is an enemy you cannot fight. You know, you can, you can have all the weapons in the world, you will still lose against this one enemy. This, will, this one will get you, right? And these, all these great powers that thought, who's gonna come against us? You know, Allah even tells them on the day of Jannah, aren't you the one who used to swear, مَا لَكُمْ مِنْ زَوَالٍ أَوَلَمْ تَكُونُوا أَقْسَمْتُمْ مِنْ قَبْلٍ Weren't you the ones that used to swear much before this, that you're not gonna have any downfall, we're gonna be number one, nobody's gonna take us down? Well, time took you down too. A time came when your time, you know, was gone too. So he says that even visiting the, the ancient sites, and ruins in and of themselves is a reminder of Surah Al-Asr. So when somebody sees an ancient site, he says, وَالْعَصْرِ إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ لَفِي خُسْرِ Right, subhanAllah. This is the, the final commentary on, on that issue. Then, uh, as far as the loss, just a few other things. Actually, most of this I already made mention too. But uh, the suffering of the human being on this earth, this is something I wanted to highlight. You know, we, we talked about the poor starving, the victims of crime, those who basically live miserable lives in labor. You know, it, you know, human beings actually have even more suffering than animals. If you think about it, human beings have additional, in addition to physical suffering, we also have psychological suffering, right? The, the, the lion doesn't care if his grandkid got sick. He, he doesn't care, he doesn't have that consciousness. They don't care. Birds don't look after their extended relatives. They just move on. Fly, they, they take care of their cubs and their young for a very little time and then they're on their own and you don't care about them, right? Sounds a lot like modern society for human beings, but generally though, you're still emotionally, when your child is hurting, you're hurting. Perhaps even more than your child. And the psychological elements of torture are sometimes even worse than physical pain. They're even worse than physical pain. And you know, you would think, oh yeah, these are problems of the poor and the sick and the weak. What about the rich? They live good lives. Actually, they don't. Some of the highest suicide rates in the world are in some of the, some of the wealthiest counties. Even in the United States. Right? Some of the wealthiest places in the country have the highest suicide rates, people overdosing on antidepressants. You know, the farmer who's poor, who has barely like two meals to eat, can go to sleep peacefully at night. But the guy who's got like millions upon millions, and he's got like six bedrooms to choose from where I'm gonna sleep, he can't get sleep at night, he has to take antidepressants. He's being killed psychologically. So they, everyone's in loss, everyone's got some kind of problem. Everyone has this. And Allah Azza wa Jal in this surah didn't just give us relief from the final loss, which is akhirah. That's the ultimate loss, right? Hellfire. Standing before Allah and having to answer for your deeds. That would be the worst loss. But He even gave us relief from the loss of this world. From, from depression, from like anxiety, from fear. You know, from oppression. He gave us, He freed us from these things also in His solution, إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ When we study that solution, we will see it's not just a remedy for the akhirah, it is also a remedy for dunya. Because in the end, the loss of the human being will happen in the akhirah, but it's also happening in dunya. It's happening here too. And Allah answers both of them in this profound surah. Like Allah Azza wa Jal says, يَا أَيُّهَا الْإِنسَانِ إِنَّكَ كَادِحٌ إِلَىٰ رَبِّكَ كَدْحًا فَمُلَاقِيهِ Amazing ayah. Human, you forgetful human being, you are marching forward, toiling forward. Kadah is to move with a, with a lot of effort, right? Whether you like it or not, you're marching towards Allah Azza wa and you will get to meet Him. Whether you think you're gonna meet Him or not, whether you prepare for it or not, whether you care or not, whether you wanna hear it or not, every single second that passes, you are one step closer to meeting Him. Every day that passes, you are one step closer to meeting Him. You could live your life of sin, and you could party it away, that's fine. Living it up, right? Like there's no tomorrow. There is a tomorrow and it's coming. And you will meet him. 
So this is, this is the, the uh, profound lesson embedded in this uh, surah also. So now, what I want to tie these two, like the loss of dunya and loss of akhirah. In this dunya, somebody says, man, I wish I had a better job. I wish I had that car. I wish I had this, you know, I wish I married that woman. I wish I could have this, I wish I could have that. I wish I didn't have this problem, I wish I didn't have that problem. What happens in the akhirah? Ya laytani kuntu turaba. I wish I was dust. Can you compare? Subhanallah, you think these problems are big? It was far bigger coming. Far bigger coming, subhanAllah. So this is when you really appreciate. Today we appreciate the loss of the human being. But then is when we'll really appreciate in the insan al fi khusr. Now we get to the last ayah, inshaAllah ta'ala, of this surah. Uh, which is really, you should remember, all of this is actually one sentence. The entire surah, وَالْعَصْرِ إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ لَفِي خُسْرِ إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ وَتَوَاصَوْا بِالْحَقِّ وَتَوَاصَوْا بِالصَّوْرِ Linguistically is one statement, one discourse. It's not disconnected. This exception, the comments we've made before, are that the exception is always the minority. And the people who don't meet the exceptional criteria are always the majority. In other words, the people in loss are the majority, and the people who are successful are the minority. But you know, there's, there's some things that we should note about society, and just the way the world works. The majority decides what is right and what is wrong. The majority sets the trends. The majority sets the standards. We do things, and by the way, even in psychology, you know how normal behavior is defined? Normal behavior is defined as what everybody does. And abnormal behavior is defined when somebody's doing something that nobody else is doing. In other words, everybody's driving this way and you're driving that way, you are doing what? Abnormal behavior, right? Now think about that from the religious point of view. You have a society where everybody does certain things. And you go to your job and everybody does certain things. But you're a Muslim, you can't do those things. Guess what they start thinking of you as? Not just, not just Muslim, but weird, abnormal. You don't fit, that guy's a little off. You know, what's he doing in that corner over there? Why, is he, why, why doesn't he eat this stuff? It's such good food. He turned it away. Why didn't he go to that party? Why did he avoid that woman that was trying to hit on him? Why did he do that? You know, they don't get and they think it's weird. And this is, by the way, when you are constantly looked at as strange, it can have an impact on you. I don't want to be weird. I don't want to be looked at as strange. So you know what happens? Even though the majority are losers, you're the, actual, you're the successful one. They start convincing you that you are living a life of loss. You need to get with the program, basically. <laughs> What they'll start convincing you of psychologically is, man, this is getting hard. I can't live like this. I need to, you know, everybody else gets to enjoy life. Why do I have to live this strange life? So the problem isn't just of accepting this truth. Knowing that the majority will be on falsehood, is, and being cognizant of that will help you and me a lot. Because the forces, the, the majority has a force, it has a pull. It, my, my teacher used to give the analogy of swimming upstream. All the fish are going this way. And there's this one or two fish, they're trying to go up the stream. It's obviously anybody who looks at that, you're crazy man, let's go this way. Everybody's headed that way. Why are you going up there for? It's harder and it's only gonna get harder. <laughs> you're only going further up. SubhanAllah. This is the example of the human being in a society that is headed, the entire society is headed in the way of loss. And you know, our challenge is a profound challenge. Because you know, if we were living in a society where Islam was being practiced as it should be, Right? If that was the case. Which by the way, isn't the case in much of the world. So don't even idealistically think, Oh, I'm going to go to the Muslim world, it's going to be great. Let's get real. What's happening in the Muslim world, we should know. But even if that was, if that was the case, and inshallah ta'ala, it will be the case. Allah will give establishment to this deen. If we were living in such a society, then obeying Allah is actually easy because the majority is doing it. So even, not just you should do it, but everybody's doing it, it becomes easier to do. But in this society, obeying Allah becomes harder because the majority is bent upon disobeying Allah. It is bent upon disobeying Allah. So much so, this isn't even the case in the society. This may even be the case inside your own family. Your own family, the majority of them may be headed towards loss and you want to save yourself and they say, why are you turning into a loser? They'll actually ironically use those terms. Why are you such a loser? Which is you know, funny because they're headed towards loss. <laughs> right? SubhanAllah. This is an amazing you know, uh, 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 thing to be aware of that's embedded in this ayah by use of the exception. Anyhow, 
إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر. The first comment we will make was is that when Allah mentioned the loss of the human being, the singular was used. Al-insan. Even though it refers to all human beings, we talked about diffusion of responsibility last time. The singular was used. Well, you know what that means? In the end, you might think you're following the crowd, you got a lot, a lot of people with you, it's the way your family does things, or your tribe does things, or your country does things, or whatever. But when it comes to suffering the consequences of your mistakes, nobody will be with you. You will be by yourself. People follow trends, but when the time comes, وَتَقَطَّعَتْ بِهِمُ الْأَسْبَابِ All their relationships will be chopped off. But when it came to the exception, Allah doesn't say, إِلَّا الَّذِي آمَنَ وَعَمِلَ صَالِحًا وَعَمِلَ الصَّالِحًا وَتَوَاصَى بِالْحَقِّ وَتَوَاصَى بِالصَّبْرِ No, He didn't use the singular. He used the plural. He used the plural. So we have to understand this transition from the singular to the plural. What we learn here is, these few people, that are going to go against the mold and they're gonna swim upstream, the only way they will survive is if they stick together. They cannot be apart. It's like that leaf that cuts off from the tree, you know, it dies. They have to remain connected to this ummah. The unity of this ummah and the believers sticking together is embedded in this ayah as part of our survival because of the use of the plural. Iman is not something you can sustain on your own. It, it, you know, iman is boosted with good company, with reminder, with counsel, with salah and jama'ah. All of these things are iman boosters, right? Because we do them together. They're collective things. So the word amul is beautiful here, that Allah Azza wa tied the exception to a collective affair. And not just, you know, you would think iman is a personal thing. Okay, good deeds, maybe we should do them together. Tawasi bil haq, tawasi bil sabr, that invo involves other people. But iman is a personal thing. But even iman, Allah Azza wa made it a collective affair. What we learn from that is, if you think you have iman and you have nothing to do with the community, the masjid, you don't go and benefit from the reminder of the, the daily reminder from the imam, you don't have counsel of good brothers around you, good sisters around you, then you are going to necessarily suffer a loss of iman. And those of you that distance yourself from the masjid sometimes, you will face it, you will feel it. Man, I, I don't feel good. I gotta go back to Allah's house. I gotta, you know. And it's not just about praying, because you could pray at home too. It's this collective, you know, uh, uh, body of believers. They, they feed off of each other. They raise the iman together. This should happen even in a circus of learning. You know, if you're sitting and listening to a lecture on your own, you might benefit. But when brothers and sisters, we learn together, it actually helps us more. It boosts the iman more. When you see a lot of people attending a program, in and of itself, that's a motivator. Man, I need to come to these things more often. Even if you don't know anyone. There's just something about La ilaha illallah that binds us together and gives us strength. Just the sight of each other gives us strength. That's what the love and affection of this ummah is supposed to be. So that's one of the things about the transition from singular to plural. The other thing we should talk about here is, إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا Allah Azza wa in this ayah, didn't mention any qualifications of iman. الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا بِاللَّهِ وَمَلَائِكَتِهِ وَكُتُبِهِ وَرُسُلِهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ Nothing. He didn't say they believe in Allah, they believe in the last day, none of that. He just said they have iman. Who are these people? What is this iman? There are so many things to talk about from the Qur'an's own point of view within iman. We'll have to pick and choose, just a couple of things inshaAllah ta'ala. The first thing we'll talk about is the fruits of iman. Just the fruits of iman. How are you supposed to know that the kind of iman you have, what, you know, what, should, you, what should you taste from it? Basically, the fruit of iman essentially is tranquility at the heart of it. The fruit of iman is tranquility. Remember we said human beings are in loss? What are the losses of the human being? Loss of health, loss of wealth, loss of loved one, right? These are the kinds of losses human beings suffer in this world. Loss of comfort. But if you have iman, then you know that this world is not permanent. This world is temporary. And what Allah has in the akhirah compared to this world is nothing. وَمَا مَتَاعُ you know, مَتَاعُ الدُّنْيَا فِي الْآخِرَةِ إِلَّا قَلِيلٌ You know, this, this الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا actually. مَتَاعُ الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا فِي الْآخِرَةِ إِلَّا قَلِيلٌ فِي سُورَةِ التَّوْبَةِ He says, what is the utilities of this, the things you use in this world, in worldly life? Compared to the akhirah, what are they? Except very little. They're not, minuscule. If you really, really, really believe that, you have iman in that. If you have iman in فَمَا أُوتِيتُمْ مِنْ شَيْءٍ فَمَتَاعُ الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا Whatever you have been given, it is utilities of worldly life. You know in that ayah, Allah says, whatever you have, no, whatever you've been given. فَمَا أُوتِيتُمْ Whatever you have been given. You know when you're given something, it doesn't belong to you. 
It belongs to the one who gave it to you. So when it's taken away, you say, well, it wasn't mine to begin with. Because he gave it to me, he has the right to take it back. When it's your own and you lose it, you say, man, I can't believe I lost my money, my house, my car, my kid, my wife. But when you realize all of this is na'im, this is given to you, this is blessing to you. When it's taken away, even when we ourselves are taken away, what do we say? We say, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi We belong to Allah. What to speak of the things we own, we belong to Allah, and we are to be returned to Him, returned to owner, right? The attitude of the believer changes. I give you just one example of just this one small aspect of iman, because if we just talk, started talking about various you know, aspects of iman, it would just take a series in and of itself. Perhaps another time inshaAllah ta'ala. But at least the fruits of iman I wanted to mention. The primary fruit being tranquility. You're at peace with your life. Whether you're poor or you're wealthy. Or you're sick or you're healthy. Or you're old or you're young. Whether people like you or don't. If you have iman, you're at peace. You're at peace with yourself, you're at peace with Allah Azza wa Jal. And this is something most human beings don't enjoy by the way. Most human beings are not at peace and they're running after it. Why do you think people go after one, go watch one movie, then another one comes out and they run after it, go... They're looking for tranquility, enjoyment, entertainment. Their heart should be finally at rest. Why is it that they get one car, then they run after another car? Get one house, run after another house. Why do we do that? Because we're not at rest. But Allah says, أَلَا بِذِكْرِ اللَّهِ تَطْمَئِنَّ الْقُلُوبِ By remembering Allah, hearts will be satisfied, they'll be tranquil, they'll be at rest. That is the real fruit of iman. That is the real fruit of... And when you have that, you have no loss. No loss is a loss. So just one example of that, inshallah, a real life example, and then we'll move forward, inshallah ta'ala. The example I want to give you is of a friend of mine who lives in New Orleans. And this, this, this friend of mine, you know, he used to own a car dealership, luxury cars, Muslim family, and they own all these cars, but they paid for them in cash because they didn't want to deal in riba and stuff. So all these German cars, high-end Japanese cars, right? And they've, they're sitting right there on the lot, surrounded by palm trees, water, it's beautiful property, right? And they're like selling hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of merchandise every single month. Business is good. And then you have Katrina, Right? And the levees break. And they're right on the water. The only car left was the, I think it was the LS400 Lexus, the top, top of the class Lexus, that they escaped in. When I went to meet the brother, he and his father, he was delivering pizza in that Lexus. That's what his job was. Now you can imagine, they went from what to what? Right? What kind of lifestyle, what kind of financial dealings, to what kind of lifestyle, where they have to now deliver pizza and work at a pizza restaurant full time but a big smile on their face. And I'm looking at them like, man, people if they suffer this kind of loss, either they pop a whole you know, bottle of Advil or Tylenol and get it over with, they jump off a cliff, they, they'll drown themselves, they can't take it anymore, you know? They don't want to deal with it. But why? What's, what smile on your face? He says, you know, when we were busy and when business was good, we didn't have time to go to the masjid, we didn't get to, I didn't get to see the wife much, didn't get to play with the kids. Now subhanAllah, we catch every salah in the masjid, there's still a roof over our head, food on our plate, what do we have to be ungrateful for? We should be grateful. <laughs> SubhanAllah. This doesn't happen unless you have iman. That kind of loss is not a loss. But if you don't have iman, then that's a loss. Then you will, be, you will collapse. You will no longer be, you won't even want to live. You know, people are willing to commit suicide because they wanted to, you know, get with this girl and she married somebody else and they jump off a bridge and this, this the real life story. Actually, I know of a Muslim kid that this happened to in the 90s in New York. Wanted to marry this girl, she married somebody else, he jumped off the, you know, the uh, Brooklyn Bridge. Jumped and he killed himself. Committed suicide. It's a sad thing. But why, when does that happen? When you long for something other than Allah. And longing for Allah will give you tranquility and that will not happen until you have Iman. This is the escape from loss. إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا This is the first thing. Then Allah Azza wa Jal mentions وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ First, in, uh, the way I organized my notes, just um, I'm going to go through the difficult vocabulary and some of the commentary, then we'll come back to the ayah as a whole and look at the lessons uh, piecemeal. But let's just uh, deal with the vocabulary first. وَعَمِلُوا عَمِلُوا The word amal in Arabic is similar to another word called fi'il. There's amal and there is fi'il. Amal is a conscious action. Amal is a conscious action. While fi'il is a sub, it can also be a subconscious action. For example, fi'il is I'm breathing right now. That's not a amal, that is what? 
It's a fi'l. I'm walking. That can be a fi'l because I'm not necessarily thinking about every step, you know, looking at my foot, hey, move forward. You don't do that. It's subconscious almost, right? When you open your eyes and you can see, that's not a amal, that is what? A fi'l. But when you speak to someone, when you speak to, when you go to work, when you drive your car, right? When you, when you buy, go and buy groceries, these are all a'mal. Because there is a conscious intent involved. You actually thought about it and then did it. So here Allah Azza wa is making us, one thing we're realizing is, we are answerable for every single act that we did consciously. Because there are behaviors, there, you know, by the way in our deen there's so much mercy, there are people who don't have control over their conscious behavior, they lose their sanity, they have all kinds of psychological disorders, they're, you know, and they are not, in our deen they're غير mukallaf. They're not held responsible for their behavior. But amal in and of itself includes conscious action. And then the, the word after it, amilu as-salihat. The word as-salihat is actually an adjective. It comes from the word salaha, which means to reconcile and to rectify. To reconcile and rectify. This is a very powerful word. It has two things in it that I want to highlight inshallah. My fear genuinely is we're not going to finish Surah Al-Asr today. Inshallah, we'll, we'll, one last session after. Inshallah, one last session. But anyway, the word as-salihat is an, is an adjective in and of itself. The word that is understood, when you know, Allah says, they do goods, literally, if you want to rough translate it, goods. But good in and of itself in English, that doesn't even sound right. Good is an adjective. But an adjective requires a noun. Good deeds. Even, you know, a lot of translations, they say, and they do good deeds. Well, the good is here in the word salih. Where's the word deeds? It's not there in the Arabic. That word would have been, وَعَمِلُوا الْأَعْمَالَ الصَّالِحَاتِ If the word al-a'mal was there, which is understood, it's mahdhuf, it's, it's implied. Now the thing that I want to highlight here are a couple of things. The first thing is the word al-a'mal in Arabic is considered jam'a mukassar. It's a broken plural. And broken plurals are supposed to have feminine adjectives. This, I know it's a little bit technical, but you'll see the benefit of it in a second, inshallah. So typically you would say, Al-A'mala as-salihata. You would put a tamarbuta on as-saliha. And that would be done. Righteous deeds. But Allah Azza wa says, Al-A'mala, and understood, but He says, As-salihati. Jam'a mudhakkar salim. This is the feminine plural form. So what's the difference between saying as-salihata, just putting a tamarbuta, as we would expect? And instead of putting the tamar buta, putting the feminine plural form. Well, the difference is from a balagha point of view, if you put the tamar buta, then those are many, many, many deeds. But when you put the feminine plural, this is considered a form of jam'u qilla, a plural of minimum. Meaning Allah is saying, righteous deeds that I'm asking you to do are not countless. They are just a few. I'm not asking a lot of you. You just have to do a few good deeds. In other words, our deen isn't composed of an endless list of instructions. Allah has asked us for a few things, and we fail to do them, right? And the fact that Allah hasn't asked us for much is inside the word of salihat. Had it been a saliha, it would have been a lot more. It would rhetorically would have been a lot more. Subhanallah. So what are these few things? You know, the muharramat are a few. The main faraid, the main obligations are a few. Then there are things in this deen that embellish your life as a Muslim. There are the sunan of the Prophet ﷺ. There are behaviors that add, you know, make your etiquette, your manners, your behaviors better and better. They increase your iman and your taqwa. But at the heart of it, there are a few things you should definitely do. And there are a few things you should definitely not do. And they're not a lot. And there are so few that any Muslim knows them. The few things at the core of this deen are so few that any Muslim knows what they should do and what they shouldn't do. Even the guy who doesn't study Islam at all, doesn't learn anything, even that person knows they should pray five times. Even that person knows they should fast in Ramadan. Even that person knows they should go to Hajj. Even that person knows they owe something to tell their non-Muslim neighbor something about it. They should tell them something about Islam at least. They should know something. At least I'll give them a CD. I'll hand them a pamphlet. Something. They know that. They know the very basics everybody knows. Even if you don't know them in academic terms, they are just a few. This is the first thing I wanted to highlight. The second thing I wanted to highlight about as-salihat is that this word in Arabic we say this has luzum and ta'addi in it. What that means in English, I know I'll use difficult words but I'll simplify them as we go on. This word is transitive and intransitive. The word salihat can be understood as transitive which is called ta'addi or muta'addi in Arabic and intransitive which is lazim 
or luzum infinitive. Okay, what does that mean? The benefit of knowing that is a salihat could be a ref, uh, it could be describing the actions. Salih means that which corrects. So these are correct actions. These are correct good actions. Actions that pro, the that in and of themselves are good, and the consequences of them are also good. That's when the word is lazim. If the word is muta'addi, you know what it means? The one who does them becomes good. Meaning these are means by which the person who does them is becoming good. In other words, this salihat could be, and the impact, the description could be of the action, and it could also be a means by which the person is being reconciled. You want to become a better person? Start doing better things. Do good things and automatically you will start to become a better person. It's like good deeds are being described in this surah like medicine that are making you better and better and better. Subhanallah. So the deeds in and of itself is good, and they are making you good. They're correcting you, they're fixing you. And the more you abandon them, the sickness comes back. And the more you take this medicine, the more you start getting healed. That is embedded beautifully inside the word as-salihat. It's incredible that Allah Azza wa Jal puts it in this way. إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا as-salihat. Then the final two, just far as far as vocabulary. Let's look at, these are a little bit tougher words, so we'll just look at my notes inshaAllah ta'ala, and conclude our third session. As far as linguistic analysis is concerned, the word tawasi, uh, related words from it are wasahu, wasahu, and awsahu, to charge someone, to command someone, bikada, to do such and such a thing. For example, if I say wasaituka, bis salah, it means I told you to make salah. I'm telling you, you really should make salah. And I'm not just telling you, I'm counseling you, I'm like kind of giving you a heart to heart. I'm doing my best to tell you, and I'm telling you in a way that makes you think this guy is telling me something that's good for me. You know there's a way to tell someone something that aggrandizes yourself. Hey, you don't make salah? What's the matter with you? Right? That's just putting yourself up and putting them down. But then when you talk to someone in a way that they feel that you want what's good for them. Right? I really think you should come. I really think you should stop doing that. I mean, I'm worried about you. You know, the tone. This is in wasiyah itself. Wasiyah literally means to leave a will. And you know who you leave a will for? Loved ones. And a will is full of things that will benefit the people after you're gone. And it, uh, when the, someone writes a will, it implies they don't have a lot of time left, so they better write it up now, because once they're gone, who knows what's gonna happen. So they, they want to leave these important parting words to this person. This is the, at, at the heart of this word. What it cre uh, includes is a sense of urgency. It's like when you tell someone the truth, you have this urgency that I'm, I'm not gonna be around tomorrow, I better get this advice out to them now when I still can. You know, a lot of times when you, somebody needs your advice, you say, I don't know, I don't know how they're gonna take it, man. I don't know if I should tell them. They're not gonna like what I have to say. We're good friends, but if I bring this up, we, not, we might not be good friends anymore. They might not wanna talk to me anymore. I'll wait for a better time. And you'll keep waiting for a better time, and a better time will never come. It's true, we should look for the right opportunity, but we should also have a sense of urgency. And the sense of urgency is inside the word tawasal. This is the first thing that we wanted to highlight. This is also used by the way, when you give someone an enormous amount of wealth. Wasiyah is also when you leave someone, bequeath someone with land or like a house or you know, a river is named after someone. This is also from Tawasi. So by implication, what that means is what you are to offer someone is literally valued advice. It's a treasure that you're giving to someone, that you're handing them over. That is really gonna be of benefit to them. Okay, so this is uh, uh, the, the, the second thing inside this word. Then finally, at tawasi is from Babat Tafa'ul, which means al ishtiraq. It includes in it this, this uh, uh, component of it is things that are done mutually. Meaning, you are enjoining the other, you're telling the other truth, and the other is telling you a truth. And a part of that lesson we'll share today. When you, tell, when you give someone good advice, sometimes they get back to you and say, Oh, yeah, what about you? You're telling me to do this? But I've seen you do this, that, or the other, you know, and they come back with you. They come back at you, with a good comeback too. Now the thing is, the normal person has the reaction, man, I'm trying to tell you something good, and all you can do is attack me. This is not about me, this is about you. This is how you would think. But tawasi implies it's about you, and it's also about me. So even if he's saying that just to get back at you, your job in the spirit of tawasi bil haq is, you know what, you're right. I should work on that. And you should just leave it at that. This is the spirit of tawasi bil haq. 
These are the stories we learn from Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, right? He's walking by, he sees, the, I'm not giving you the full narration, just a just glimpse of it. He's walking by, he looks through the window, and he sees a guy drinking. He busts inside, grabs the guy, haram. <laughs> he says, I did one, you did three. You did three, haram. First of all, you looked inside. Second of all, you came in without permission. Third of all, you made an assumption. How do you know I'm drinking alcohol? <laughs> right? You made three. Umar ibn Khattab says, you're right. And he walks away. Doesn't say anything. Weeks go by. He's given khutbah and the same guy shows up in the khutbah. He sits all the way in the back. And after the khutbah is done, he sneaks up to Umar radiallahu anhu. He says, Umar says to him, you know, ever since that day, I stopped checking, you know, looking at people. I didn't tell anyone about you either. And the guy says, ever since that day, I stopped drinking. <laughs> but the idea is you tell someone, but you also expect that they will tell you. And it may, might not be in a way that you like. That's okay. In the end, there's, if there's even an element of truth in it, you take it. Even, you know, Umar bin al-Khattab could say, yeah, I know I'm wrong, but you're still wrong too. Come with me. No, he just took it. And you know what that shows? That shows sincerity. That shows sincerity. Your, your ability to take criticism. Your ability to, for someone to come up to you and say you're wrong and you say you're right. In the spirit of tawasi bil haq. Because that is a gift someone has given you. How many times do we think when someone comes to us and gives us serious, genuine counsel that they are actually giving us a gift? Most of us look at it as an attack on our ego. Right? We look at, how dare you? Who are you? Who are you? To, what, where did you get your ijazah that you can tell me what to do? Who made you shaykh? Right? Since when are you the imam? Right? These are the kinds of questions you might get. Who do you think you are? This is the kind of thing you might get. But what's your attitude when you're corrected? You take the best of it. Leave the bad of it. Don't assume this guy's doing it to insult me or humiliate me. Whatever. Their intention is with Allah. You don't have to judge their intention. You leave that alone. You just take the good of it. This is part of the spirit of tawasi bil haq. Inshallah ta'ala in our next session we'll also talk about the meanings of the word haq but I'll just go run through my notes at least to at least that part is done and we can uh, finish up a detailed discussion of the last ayah in our next session. So in, in terms of uh, this last ayah the summary of a shawkani rahimahullah is أَيْ جَمَعُوا بَيْنَ الْإِيمَانِ بِاللَّهِ وَالْعَمَلِ الصَّالِحِ فَإِنَّهُمْ فِي رَبْحٍ لَا, خسر لا, لا فِي خُسْر That these people gathered and they combined between iman and good action. And this is something that comes up in tafsir over and over and over and over again. Iman and action are necessary consequences of each other. If you do good deeds, your iman will increase. And if you have iman, there is no way you can have it without doing good deeds. What kind of iman is this? That you have it and it doesn't lead you to any action. That's impossible. And there's no good action that doesn't end up increasing your iman. Okay, so they, they have a, this mutual relationship. So when they develop this, فَإِنَّهُمْ فِي ربح, Then they are definitely in a profit and not in any kind of loss. When they are able to make that connection between iman and action. Unfortunately, a lot of Muslims believe their iman, rather their Islam is good enough. They're, they're, they're set for paradise because they already said, La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah Wasallam. Without getting into, into any theological, historical debates about which group said this, about iman and amal, which group said that, without getting into any of that. Just from a psychological point of view, people have that as an escape. Just like Christians have the escape. I already said the name of the Lord, you know. I already pronounced, I, I said I love Jesus, now I could be a drug dealer for all I care. It's all good. I'm already saved. We have the same exact mentality seeped into the Muslim community when somebody says, I'm already Muslim. Yeah, I messed up, I do a lot of haram things, but come on. I'm already, I already got my ticket right here. I already said, La ilaha illallah. I already said, Muhammadur Rasulullah That's good enough. I should be alright, because my iman is there. This surah makes it clear. إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا Not enough. وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ وَتَوَاصَوْا بِالْحَقِّ وَتَوَاصَوْا بِالصَّبْرِ When you fulfill all for it, then you're saved. Until then, you're not saved. And what it also teaches is, if you think you have iman and none of this is happening, then you probably don't have iman. Chances are, you think you have iman, but you don't. So the Bedouins thought they had iman. قَالَتِ الْعَرَابُ آمَنَّا In Surah Al-Hujurat, they said, we have iman. Allah said, قُلْ لَمْ تُؤْمِنُوا No, you didn't, have, you didn't get iman yet. وَلَكِنْ قُلُوا أَسْلَمْنَا You only have Islam. وَلَمَّا يَدْخُلِ الْإِيمَانُ فِي قُلُوبِكُمْ Iman hasn't entered your hearts yet. And what is the proof that iman hasn't entered your hearts yet? وَإِن تُطِيعُ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ If you obey Allah and His Messenger, doesn't action get mentioned? Allah says, you don't have iman, you only have Islam. 
But you, an iman hasn't come into your heart. What should you do to get it into your heart? Obey Allah and His message. Do action. لا يلتكم من أعمالكم شيء and none of your deeds will be wasted away. Subhanallah. These are the, the, the combination of these two things. A couple of notes left inshaAllah, in the next five minutes will be done. I'll just read through them quickly. As the Makhshari comments when, he com- when it comes to tawasaw bil haq in the explaining al haq he says tawheed in- includes tawheed, includes obedience to Allah and His Messenger, it includes being distanced from worldly ambition and inclination towards the hereafter. As Shawkani, when he talks about tawasi bil haq he says, وَصَّى بَعْضُهُمْ بَعْضًا بِالْحَقِّ أَلَّذِي يَحِقُّ الْقِيَامِ بِهِ They enjoin to each other, exhort each other, advise each other with the truth that deserves to be established. Meaning they give each other advice that should be implemented. Qatada says, بالحق أي بالقرآن Beautiful. Qatada رحمه الله says, when they give each other the best counsel to the truth, the word truth, he says the truth here means the Qur'an. They give each other ayat of Qur'an full of love and affection and, and concern for the other. So we remind each other through the ayat of Allah. May Allah include this gathering in that. So, so we, and then أي بالقرآن وقيل بالتوحيد And it's also said they remind each other with tawheed. والحمل على العموم الأولى And most people understand it to the, the, the first meaning, meaning any good, any truth that, is, that deserves to be established and to be lived by. Ibn Kathir rahimahullah says, الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا بِقُلُوبِهِمْ Those who truly believed with their hearts. وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ بِجَوَارِحِهِمْ And they did good deeds with all of their limbs. Meaning, once their heart was submitted, their entire body submitted by good deeds. وَتَوَاصَوْ بِالْحَقِّ وَهُوَ أَدَاءُ الطَّاعَاتِ And they, they uh, enjoined and exhorted each other to the truth. And this is giving of our, uh, and ex- ex- executing all the acts of obedience. وَتَرْكُ الْمُحَرَّمَاتِ And to abandon all the things that are haram. وَتَوَاصَوْ بِالصَّبْرِ أَيْ عَلَى الْمَصَائِبِ وَالْأَقْدَارِ And they enjoined, exhorted each other to perseverance. Meaning against all kinds of calamities and all kinds of situations that they find themselves in. وَأَذَنْ وَأَذَّى مَنْ يُؤْذِي مِمَّنْ يَأْمُرُونَهُ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَيَنْهَوْنَهُ عَلَى الْمُنْكَرِ And this is, they held perseverely and they held on to their, their commitment and their zeal, this sabr, whenever they were tortured because of them commanding to good and forbidding from evil. In other words, when you command to good and forbid evil, then you will face consequences. You will get in trouble, you will even, might even get tortured, and at that point, you tell each other, stay on it and remain uh, with sabr, remain sabirun. يعتبر التواصي بالحق من الخاص بعد العام. Others say that التواصي بالحق is and this uh, this is by the way شنقيتي رحمه الله. It is understood as a special act after the general was mentioned. What he means by that is عمل الصالحات. They do good things, and telling each other about the truth is a good thing. So why mention good things and then mention one of them? This is الخاص بعد العام. This is a special good deed after. The general, the one of which is the, of most importance or the one easily, easiest forgotten. This came up before. That's what he's mentioning. لِأَنَّهُ دَاخِلْ فِي عَمَلِ الصَّالِحَاتِ Because it is included in the, the good deeds. عَلَى مَا يَبْلُ اللَّهِ بِهِ عِبَادَهُ عَنِ الْمَعَاصِي The Makhshari comments in Tawasi bil Sabr. This is sabr over whatever Allah tests, tests his slave with and also sabr and not falling into temptation. In, in disobedience. In other words, the believer will be put into times of temptation. He'll be, he'll be seduced into getting into things. He'll, his greed might take over him. His temptation might take over him. And at that point, he has to have sabr to not fall into those things. May Allah protect us from falling into disobedience. And then finally on the sequence, وَجَعَلَ التَّوَاسِي بِالصَّبْرِ قَرِيلًا لِلتَّوَاسِي بِالْحَقِّ دَلِيلٌ عَلَىٰ عَظِيمِ قَدْرِهِ Allah puts sabr at the end and haqq first is as an evidence of the power of enjoining the truth, that, that it's more uh, powerful and more important. وَفَخَامَةَ شَرْفِهِ وَفَخَامَةِ شَرْفِهِ rather, and the weight of its nobility. مزيد ثواب الصابرين على ما يحق الصبر عليه. This is, you know, تواصي بالحق. What he is saying in this ayah now, الشنقيتي رحمه الله is saying, الصابرين are those who, whenever the situation comes that demands patience, they execute it. There's one thing to encourage each other to be patient. It's the, it's another thing to be patient when it's time to be patient. We lose our patience, and when somebody says, you know, you need to be patient right now. No, no, no. This is not the time to be patient. I, will, I know I should be, but you don't understand, this is a special case, right? Every time you need to be patient, you say, I have a special case exception, <laughs> right? This is, this is exactly what a person who doesn't have sabr do, does. You know, whenever the advice is given, they say, I know that's the advice, but I have an exceptional situation. 
I know I should have sabr, but not right now. This is good advice. I know it's in the Quran, but not for me, not for right now. But that's the attitude we have to get rid of. All the advice of this book is for me, right now. There's never a time when it doesn't apply. And when you start thinking like that selectively, then these things become useless. This advice is useless. Because when you need it the most is when you abandon it. When does the advice to have sabr become important? When you're losing your temper, when you're tempt tempted. When you're gonna fall into disobedience, that's when it's important. When you're sitting in a gathering of good people, I should be patient. Yeah, I should be patient. That's not an accomplishment. That's not an accomplishment, you see. So this is the, the, the final thing uh, about it. Inshallah ta'ala in our next session, we will take an overview look and a careful look at how these four things are connected in, in the Qur'an. إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ وَتَوَاصَوْا بِالْحَقِّ وَتَوَاصَوْا بِالصَّبْرِ We'll study that inshallah ta'ala. We'll also study the use of the ba in bilhaq and bisabr, the rhetorical usage of the ba. بارك الله لي ولكم في القرآن الحكيم ونفعني وإياكم بالآيات والذكر الحكيم والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته